It's an honor to be here. This is, I think, our fourth or fifth year. You mentioned earlier you were here uh, third year. And um, it's interesting to see um, how things have evolved. Um, look at how the conference uh, has grown. Uh, uh, Genia, I think, um, was an eight-person company when we, uh, when we first presented here. Um, we were uh, 30 people when we were acquired in, in June by Roche. Uh, we're 80 people. Um, uh, now, if you look at also how the, um, the space has evolved, um, when we were first uh, presenting here, we were talking uh, mostly about the um, uh, technical specifics of the sequencing uh, technology, the physics, the chemistry uh, behind it. Um, and uh, most of the uh, applications of sequencing were in, in research, right? Um, and the predictions we were making at the time was that it would move into the clinic. Um, and all that's happened um, with, with a huge force, um, perhaps uh, faster than many of us uh, have predicted. So now we're here um, uh, talking uh, about where sequencing is, is being used and, and, and how it's going to continue to be used in the future. So, so the things we've talked about uh, have come, come true um, in, in a great way and um, uh, really changed uh, the nature of this, this space. You know, the, the oncology space in particular, the, the company that acquired us, and is obviously now an investor in foundation medicine as well, uh, Roche, uh, is a, um, a, a big uh, player, as most of you know, both on the pharmaceutical side with oncological drugs as well as on the diagnostic side. And um, one of the key reasons they uh, wanted to acquire Genia and, and, and liked our technology was that they uh, looked specifically at the applicability of this technology in the, uh, in the oncology space. Um, so what the thinking behind that was, was that the way oncological tests are going to be performed is, is, is changing. It's moving away from a hypothesis-driven uh, model where you really had to have a concrete idea of what was going on, order a specific test, to more of a whole uh, a genome uh, sequencing approach. And you've mentioned it in your three-stage uh, model there with a the comprehensive profile as the stage three. Well, we, we think the stage four is going to be whole uh, genome or whole exome uh, uh, sequencing of the tumor um, uh, cells, uh, of the person's healthy cells by uh, a comparison. Um, and uh, we believe that uh, the technology that we're uh, developing, Agenia, uh, is particularly suited for uh, those types of um, uh, applications. Now, why, why are you, would you be interested in sequencing the whole uh, tumor exome, the whole tumor genome? Well, there's a lot of things that you don't pick up if you just look at individual mutations, even if you have a comprehensive uh, profile. Uh, um, for example, uh, you find structural mutations in the, uh, in the cancer cells over, over time that are hard to pick up if you're just looking at individual spots. You know, those are invisible if you're only uh, uh, sequencing short pieces. And they're also very, very hard to see with a short read technology. But if you have a long read technology like Genius or uh, the PacBio technology that Roche has also in, uh, invested in, then you can see how the cancer DNA changes over time and how the whole structure of the, of the uh, uh, chromosome changes. And, and, and there's a lot of, uh, we expect to see a lot of uh, clinical relevance in those structural uh, mutations as well. Um, the other thing that you're going to see is uh, to Nick's point, you're going to be able to pick up on the heterogeneity of the tumor. You know, if the tumor uh, cells uh, evolve over time, and, and in one tumor, you have different cells with different stages of mutations. And if you're able to sequence whole or long stretches of DNA from these tumor cells, then you're going to be much more likely to be able to piece together what happened in one particular cell versus another. And that's going to allow you to uh, target your treatment at the root core mutations of that tumor versus just targeting at, uh, at those mutations that were introduced later in the disease where you're going to be able to see some remission initially, but then the disease comes back because you really didn't pick up at the root uh, mutation. So those are all uh, uh, good reasons to have a, um, a, uh, a technology uh, uh, for uh, cancer uh, uh, sequencing and oncology and next-gen technology that allows you to do Long reads allows you to do them cost effectively um, so that you can uh, make this something that's applied routinely to all patients. You know, 35,000 is, is a great number, and I applaud you for, for getting there in such a short time. But every cancer patient in the country should be sequenced routinely. And we have to bring the cost down to the point where that becomes uh, affordable. That's something that we're working on. And then finally, um, uh, to do, again, what you guys are, are uh, doing at Foundation, is to start looking at all that data and tying it back together, um, not just for that particular patient, 
but going back later and, and, and comparing that to, to other tumors so that what the information that you gain through these um, commercial diagnostic efforts effectively also becomes a, a research program that allows us to better understand what cancer uh, uh, does and how it, how it operates in the basic mechanisms. So that's the promise of, of applying a low-cost, um, uh, uh, long-read um, technology to next-gen sequencing. And I'm very happy to be a, a part of Roche uh, now where we have the resources to really be able uh, to uh, bring that to market and to have that bear fruit. Sounds great. Thanks, Stefan. We'll come back to Stefan with uh, questions in a few moments. Krishna, over to you. So, uh, so I actually, as, as I was uh, walking around the conference today, uh, you know, I just uh, realized how many folks here uh, we've worked with in a lot of different contexts. Uh, I think uh, we're sitting just a few, like less than a mile away from Google. Um, and we often kind of get the question of what, you know, what Google's doing uh, you know, at these healthcare conferences <laughs> and investing in companies like Foundation Medicine. And, and uh, you know, I think at its very core, uh, it's that it's perhaps one of the most exciting areas, uh, you know, perhaps anywhere, uh, because we're finally seeing uh, some of these promises about what genomics can do in clinical medicine uh, actually taking hold. Uh, you know, I, I love that you, uh, you put that, that slide up there from Mark uh, from the J.P. Morgan conference back in 1999 because I think that's a vision that uh, a lot of us have seen. Uh, we've, we've heard the promise and I think we're now seeing the patients, uh, you know, going through the system and I think it's um, uh, clearly right at the very beginning of how this is all going to expand. I think Stefan's point is right on. You know, there's 35,000 patients who've gone through this, you know, others through other sequencing systems. but. You know, there's still a lot more patients out there who, um, who, who don't have access to this sort of technology uh, and who will. And so as we look at this from an IT perspective, it's really clear that there's a lot of different places where IT touches uh, NGS entering the clinical space. There's uh, all the places that I think the field has been working on extensively for years, uh, places like, uh, you know, how to actually do the reads, how to actually uh, identify the mutations, how to report. I think increasingly there's a lot of work around how to ingest the literature uh, and organize that data. And in order to actually put together systems that really uh, are providing these sorts of reports for all of the cancer patients out there, all of that needs to be done in a systematic, scalable sort of fashion. I think the area that we're starting to spend a lot more time on now, now that, now that this early part of actually getting the data from the tumor, actually sequencing it, actually getting the reports generated. I think one of the areas we're starting to spend a lot of time uh, on now is really uh, you know, what's happening to these patients. We're, what are the phenotypes of oncology patients? And, and what do we do with that data as we start to tie it together uh, with the genetic information? And uh, I think Foundation and other, other companies are starting to actually get pretty deep into, into that side of uh, the equation. And certainly from uh, the Google Ventures perspective, that's where we're spending a lot of our time. And it, it turns out to be a really different sort of problem uh, than the early set of problems I think that the NGS field has, has solved. Uh, you know, it, it starts to talk about, uh, you know, garnering data from electronic medical records, pulling data that's currently in the heads of physicians, and perhaps most challengingly, getting data from patients. Uh, so there's all sorts of uh, information about what patients are going through day in, day out uh, with the various sorts of chemotherapeutic regimens and various sorts of adjuvant therapies that, uh, that we use that are essentially completely lost, not recorded in the, in the EMR. And then there's all sorts of data that we as a society are paying for uh, and are in the EMR but are fundamentally unused uh, as part of the overall goal in, in improving cancer care. And, uh, and so, you know, the way that uh, the sorts of technologies, the sorts of people who one needs to bring into this fold, uh, you know, are, uh, I think, still just getting uh, knowledgeable about what personalized medicine is, how to actually engage with this community. And, uh, and at least from my perspective, I find that to be incredibly exciting because it suggests kind of the next wave of where this whole uh, set of efforts uh, goes. And I think, I think we're actually starting to see that all start to come together. I think it's incredibly challenging from a uh, from a uh, you know from a team building perspective because these are people who largely don't know each other yet. The sorts of people who you need in order to come up with the interfaces that a physician, a pathologist, a payer, a pharma company, a patient, 
you know, the sort of interfaces that all of these folks are going to use, they're all slightly different. Their incentives are slightly different. And, uh, and the folks who think deeply about how to tie all those things together uh, you know, are slightly different than the, the folks who are applying the deep biostatistics to uh, you know, actually create uh, high quality diagnostics. Uh, but you know what, I think we're at, we're at a moment where all of these things are starting to come together. And, uh, and I think we, like uh, probably everybody in this room, see the promise uh, of how big this is really going to be. And, and uh, you know, I, for one, uh, will say that you know, as exciting as, uh, as cancer is, um, you know, I think the thing that's most exciting to me is that it, it likely will provide a blueprint for how we can start approaching other diseases. Uh, and so you know, I'm paying a lot of attention to how this story is playing out here, because you know, it may not be next year or five years from now, but but over, over the course of the coming years, I think we all anticipate seeing a lot of these same patterns repeat themselves as we start to find new discoveries and new areas and new ways to use NGS in other disease areas.